Tonight our focus uh, once more is on the Gospel of Mark, and for those of you that have been with us weeks, we have been poking around through the Gospel of Mark, attempting to use this Gospel as a means of personally helping us to study the Bible more effectively on an individual level. And we have now traveled through the first five chapters of Mark. I hope they have been enriching and exciting for you. I must say that every time I'm in this gospel, again, my heart gets so revived and my spirit draws close to the Lord. We have each evening as we have started out taken a moment to review and set a context for where we have been so that in our own way we might do a shorthand work of memorizing this gospel. And thus far we have uh, taken sections uh, 1, chapter 1, 1 through 13, 114 to 145, 21 to 36, 37 to 335, 41 to 34, 530, 435 through the end of chapter 5. Is that all confusing and clear? Let's see, rather than using the numbers, if you can remember the titles. The first division of paragraphs was... Oh, good. Some of you are there. Get out your notes if you can't remember. Preparation. First four paragraphs, preparation. Then following that from 114 through the end of chapter 1 was a section of opening events. Jesus healing, teaching, and calling disciples. Chapter 2, 1 through 3, 6 dealt with a theme that concerned opposition. For the first time, Jesus was drawing blood in his ministry over the issue of did he have authority to forgive sins? Did he have the right to challenge uh, practices such as uh, the particular method of keeping the Sabbath? Did he have a right to break tradition with eating with sinners and tax collectors? Then 3.7 through 3.35 was counter-opposition. Jesus now charges right back at the opposition and uh, selects disciples and alleges that uh, they're crossing a fine line into blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is eternal sin. Then chapter 4, there's a kind of a calm mood in the first 34 verses. As Jesus, by uh, the uh, lake of Galilee and the hills, is teaching his disciples. And he is teaching them about the kingdom, kingdom parables. Showing that the kingdom is not something external and political, but something inward and it must be received. And then from 435 through the end of chapter 5, a section of four miracles which are the selected miracles, a miracle that shows his authority over nature, a miracle that shows his authority over demons, a miracle that shows his authority over illness, and a miracle that shows his authority over death. That brings us to tonight, chapter 6. So, preparation, opening events, opposition, counter-opposition, kingdom parables, selected miracles, and we are tonight where we are. Now, chapter 6 is I don't, uh, it's not the longest chapter in the Gospel of Mark, but it's the longest chapter in the first half. And actually it only has seven paragraphs, but the paragraphs in the Revised Standard Version are very, very long. So I think that tonight, rather than reading this chapter in its entirety as we've done in previous times where we've read and then given a paragraph title and moved on, I think that uh, in light of the uh, fact that sometimes in Bible study we just need to be flexible and not always do the same thing every time, We'll just take a paragraph at a time, poke our way through it, and when we get to the end, we'll say we've arrived at the end. What, it, what was it all talking about? Okay, what was it saying to our heart, and how do we title this particular passage? 6.1, he went away from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom given to him? What mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, obviously, what is happening to Jesus here has to do with his own country, which was the city. We don't see it here in Mark, but we know it to be the city of Nazareth. And he is being rejected at Nazareth. So a title that I've given to this paragraph is simply Nazareth Rejection. That helps me remember it. By the way, if you go to Nazareth today, one of the interesting things, Nazareth, Nazareth today is divided into lower and upper Nazareth. Upper Nazareth is elite, uh, which is... Uh, the, is it Greek or Hebrew or Greek or Latin for upper? 
Upper Nazareth. Upper Nazareth is Jewish. Lower Nazareth is Arab. The official government of the city of Nazareth today, interestingly enough, is dominated by the Communist Party. Uh, the Communist Party is legal uh, in, the, in the country of, of Israel, as long as it doesn't advocate political overthrow of the government. And uh, so a town of about uh, 60,000 people, 35,000 Arabs, about 25,000 Jews. But among the Arab population, there is a strong Christian presence. In fact, in the Holy Land, uh, one of the few places in the uh, contemporary world in the Middle East where there is Christian presence among Arab people. If you want to add somebody to your prayer list, add Eli Zakini, who is the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Nazareth. Eli Zakini is a spirit-filled Baptist who is the head of all the evangelical work. Baptist and Pentecostal sort of have merged together. All the evangelical work among the Arab peoples in Galilee. Eli Zakini is a powerful spokesman for the gospel. In the Baptist church at Nazareth, there are 600 young people today that are in their elementary and secondary school, private school, for evangelical Christian Arab young people. It is the strongest and most promising work among the Arab peoples in all of Galilee. But Jesus found that in his hometown, he was not received. Where did this man get all this wisdom and, the, and his works? Is not this the carpenter, which shows us that Jesus had followed in the trade of his stepfather, Joseph? Also, the fact that he is called the son of Mary and no reference is made to Joseph is an indication already that to Joseph had passed from the scene. Indeed, after Jesus' 12th birthday, when he went down to Jerusalem and stunned the teachers of the law in the temple, Joseph drops out of the text. So we're to assume that somewhere in Jesus' life, between his being age 12 and 30, Joseph passed away. Jesus inherited the trade. Some have said that this appellation of Jesus is not this the son of Mary, reflects the fact that in this Jesus' hometown, the gossip never died. And people remember that later in her pregnancy, the young lady, Mary, escaped with her fiancé down to Bethlehem and the circumstances of the necessity for their flight were probably not blamed upon the idea of being born, a vir uh, being born of a virgin, but rather I wouldn't at all be surprised that at Nazareth it was always sort of the underlying current and gossip that Jesus had been born illegitimately, that Joseph and Mary had simply not waited until their wedding day. And if any of you know anything about living in a small town, you know how long stories stay around. And Nazareth would have no, been no, longer, no larger than a town of 15,000 people in Jesus' day. By the way, just a word on Nazareth. Nazareth was strategically uh, uh, occupied, uh, situated in Jesus' day because it occupied the hill country that overlooked the Valley of Jezreel, which we call the Valley of Armageddon. In the far distance, if you're sitting on the brow at Nazareth, you can look over and you can see Mount Carmel. You can look toward Megiddo. You can see Mount Tabar where Deborah defeated Barak. All the history of the land is right before you. And you can, you can envision as a boy Jesus at Nazareth sitting on the brow of that hill and remembering the history of his people as the armies from Egypt came through the Valley of Jezreel, as the Babylonians and the Assyrians came through that valley, as great battles occurred right below Nazareth. And yet... Being a town in a strategic geographical position, it was a little bit off-road so that it was a protected space for him, a nurturing place for him to grow. It's obvious from the text of our Gospels that uh, Jesus, when he was a boy and a young man at Nazareth, did not teach nor did he do miracles because they are saying of him, where did this man get all this wisdom and these works? Implying that they had not seen this up until this time, that that was a stunner for them. Therefore, indeed, as the Gospels indicate to us, his public ministry had begun at first at Canaan, Galilee, where he did his first miracle, and then his preaching ministry had begun at Capernaum, as Mark indicates. We see here in the text also the fact that Jesus not only had a mother, but that he had brothers and sisters. And uh, there are some who say, oh, well, uh, wasn't Mary a perpetual virgin? And uh, unfortunately, the New Testament text doesn't support that view. Because Jesus had four brothers that are named, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and he has sisters who are not named, but the fact that sisters is in the plural indicated he had at least two. So in addition to Jesus, who was the child of Mary by this 
supernatural conception of the Holy Spirit, there was, in addition to, to that, six other, at least six other children, four boys and at least two girls, that were born to Mary and Joseph. You say, well, couldn't these brothers be cousins or children of Joseph by an earlier marriage or whatever? Remote possibility. The Greek word that's used is adelphos, which is the same word that is used for blood brothers throughout the New Testament. For example, uh, Peter and Andrew are adelphoi, brothers. Uh, James and John are adelphoi, brothers. Uh, here the word brothers occurs in the text again. So the common word for straight out blood brothers. He had a family. His, he grew up in a normal nurturing environment. I would simply say, kind of by way of spiritual application of this text, that we must be careful that we do not at any point in our experience lock Jesus in a box of our prior expectations. If, it, if there's anything I learned from this Nazareth rejection is that when Jesus began to present to them new evidences of himself and who he was, they were unwilling to receive them because they already had a caricature of what he was. He is a carpenter. He is son of Mary. He has brothers and sisters. And the idea that he has wisdom and works somehow had not dawned on them and they were not willing to admit into their life new evidences. And I think if, if, it, if everything were to be put out on the table that one of the fundamental reasons why Jesus is not received and believed by people in the world today is that he has been rejected on the basis of premature and incorrect conclusions that have been drawn about him, that people have not allowed themselves to get into the New Testament or receive the evidence which he is presenting of himself. It's like uh, when, a, when a child is in first grade, and uh, maybe you go back to this in your own life, and uh, the teacher goes out of the room. A uh, child goes up, if he's a uh, child like I was, and uh, draws on the blackboard uh, a circle, stick figure, legs and arms, and draws a mean scowl on the teacher. Probably the teacher is a beautiful 25-year-old young woman, but in the little six, first grader, six-year-old's mind, she's an ugly, old, 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 uncaring, mean, nasty person. So he's got this caricature of teacher on the board, and he writes, you know, if he can spell it underneath his caricature, teacher. That's his idea of the teacher. Unfortunately, what he draws on the board doesn't match the reality of the warm and vivacious person that everyone who's the peer to the teacher knows she really is. And I've wondered, uh, as I have dealt with Christian young people over the years who have sometimes grown up in Christian homes and even ministerial homes who have received a picture of Jesus that does not square with the picture that we get in his word. And I have found that people have walked away from Jesus Christ before they really understood who he was because they have rejected him on the basis of a premature conclusion. I was at the point of doing that in my own life as a junior in college of saying, well, you know, Jesus, I don't really know who you are. And a, a person came to Evangel College and preached for a week on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I got a fair hearing in my life as to who he was. It's interesting now that that person, as many of you know, is Gene Scott, the wild man of Christian television. Those of us that know Gene, and I track back to Gene when I was 15 years of age, and he was my associate minister and youth pastor. He was 27 years of age, and I was 15. Never forget the first sermon he ever preached at Central Assembly in Springfield, Missouri. He just gotten his doctorate from Stanford. He was introduced, and he was a powerful preacher. And uh, in the middle of his sermon, he stopped, and he looked over to the overflow room where the young people sat, and he said, George and Tom, I told you before the service that if you talked during the service, that I was going to publicly stop the service and call you out. And my heart just absolutely froze still because, as you know, what my name is. But then I looked around. I wasn't sitting next to Tom. I thought, wow, I'm safe. But he had, he had heard about the reputation of two kids in the youth group, the leading deacon's son and an assistant general superintendent's son, and he had privately talked to them and told them that he wasn't going to put up with no guff from them. And so when they talked in the middle of his sermon, he just stopped the sermon and cleaned house. He lasted nine months as associate pastor at that church. It's interesting how character grows over the years and along the lines that we plan it. But Gene came along and preached on the resurrection. It was before he was puffing cigars and wearing funny hats and reading books on pyramids. And you know, I've looked, I've grieved. I'm off the subject now, I know, but... Uh, 
I really feel, you know, Gene was a unique gift to the body of Jesus Christ. He could have been a C.S. Lewis. He could have been a Francis Schaeffer. It's, uh, in my opinion, one of the great losses in the Christian church that he has uh, gone the direction that he's gone. And I no, make no judgment on the condition of his soul. I can't say that. Only God knows that. I just know that there was an unusual gift to the body of Christ, which somewhere along the line uh, lost its uh, clean clean-centered approach of uh, the early years. But I was willing, as I heard who Jesus really was, to lay aside this caricature and to embrace him. And I suppose there are moments in each one of our lives where we get, you know, in our service to the Lord, we need to get a fresh vision of who he is and have an adequate view of him that meets our present situation. And in Nazareth, Jesus was simply rejected on the basis of caricature. And he was presenting new evidences, and only a few had faith. And for the few who had faith, they saw him really do marvelous works. The Nazareth rejection is followed by a paragraph that is the shortest in the Gospel of Mark that takes up half a verse in the Revised Standard Text, and I don't know how it lays in the NIV, but again, we know that the NIV does not do good paragraphing. Right? Just kidding. Some of you are not picking, tracking with me tonight. It's been a long week. He went about the villages teaching. That's the length of the paragraph, 66B. And uh, I simply call this village teaching. It is uh, another illustration in Jesus' life and ministry of his traveling. He was unlike John the Baptist who stayed in one place. Then we get a paragraph, the third paragraph that begins in verse 7. He called to him the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ch charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, by the way, if you read Matthew 10, you immediately say, well, isn't there a conflict here? Because Matthew 10 says he charged them to not acquire a staff. And Mark is saying he told them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. Is that a direct contradiction? And the answer is no, if you read the verb closely. Jesus in Matthew is quoted as saying, don't acquire a staff, which means go out and get a new one. That is, he's saying to them, travel with whatever you have. If you have a normal walking stick, take it, but don't go out and get something special. Take no bread, no bag, no money in your belt, but to wear sandals and not put on two suits. And he said to them, when you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place, and if any place will not receive you and they refuse to hear you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet for a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil, first time we've come across that, and many that were sick, and healed them. This is the first training mission. There's some who've taken this scripture and said, here's the way all missionary endeavor ought to take place. You simply go out and you go out on faith and the Lord will provide. Don't take anything with you. All right, Bill and Joy, is that okay? Don't take anything with you. How come we're raising support and having a budget and all that sort of thing, and yet we hear, we read here, not to take anything with you? Well, the reason is that in this particular text, this is a short, limited mission. It is to people that were of their own ethnicity and living in their own localities, people who spoke the language they spoke, and it was, from Jesus' point of view, the first chance for them to go out and begin to build their faith and learn to depend upon him in a far more radical way in their life. You see, the disciples of Jesus were not enrolled in a college like Southern California College or a Bible school where they would sit in class for semesters at a time and finally after four years of education go out and become involved in some practical phase of ministry. Their education consisted of listening to him and then immediately going out and applying it in some way. So they're going out in application. We all know the best way to learn is to go do it. If you're going to learn to drive a car, for goodness sakes, don't just confine yourself to reading books on how to drive a car. Go out and drive it. Best thing somebody did for me in learning how to swim. I never just could seem to learn, and I still don't swim too well, but they just shoved me in the pool. It's a marvelous way. Get in there and get going. And sometimes we wait in our Christian service. We say, well, I'm, how can I ever be a Sunday school teacher? How can I ever be a witness? I don't know enough. I haven't read enough books yet. I haven't taken a course yet. And and for goodness sakes, you know, take all the courses and read all the books, but don't let that be a substitute for actually going out and doing it. You'll learn far more by doing it than by sitting around waiting to learn more about it. So Jesus sends them out. But he knows that they're just beginning, so he, he slaps them with some limitations. 
Matthew's gospel tells us he limits their geography, first of all. He says to them, don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. Mark leaves that detail out probably because he's writing Romans and it would take him paragraphs to explain what Jesus meant, so he just leaves it out. You know, that's good, by the way, that's a good way to do it. If, if you're going to say something that will confuse people, because from their particular uh, cultural context, they don't apprehend or understand it, well, why raise the confusion? So Matthew just doesn't, or Mark doesn't even report it, but Matthew says it. So Matthew's writing to Jews who would understand what Jesus was saying. Don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. Why? Because the Lord's racially prejudiced? No, not at all. It's because these disciples are prejudiced. And they go out, they're still calling Gentiles dogs. You know, how in the world could they go minister to Gentiles? And, and we know two of them are, are still have this desire to torch Samaritan villages. You know, Jesus goes through a place the Samaritans and they won't receive them. So they came to Jesus and they say, uh, could you burn them down, Lord? So wonderful type of evangelism called scorched earth evangelism. You know. And they, were, they weren't ready to handle cultural and ethnic diversities. So Jesus slaps a barrier on their geography and says, don't go to anybody but the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is his way of saying to us, well, start where you're at. If you're not ready for South Africa, how about South Coast of Mesa, West Coast of Mesa, East Coast of Mesa, South Santa Ana, North Santa Ana, wherever. Start where you're at. Start with your family and friends. Start with people who are close to you culturally, who speak your language, are your age. Begin there. That's what Jesus does. And it's good, good training methodology, isn't it? Does it send us out to do something that's impossible? And he slaps also a limitation on their baggage. Don't take things with you. Don't take a bread box. Don't take a wallet. Just go out. Uh, why does he do that? Because they must learn to live, begin living on faith, and they must also do that most difficult thing for people who go vocationally full-time in the Lord's service. They must learn to begin to do one of the most difficult things I know to do in the ministry, and that is receive from other people. I always have wished I was independently wealthy so that I could serve this church without taking anything from anybody to make a living. It just galls me no end that I have no vocational training for any useful task. <laughs> Except the ministry. Go out, Jesus says. And uh, he does a very neat thing here. You know the Lord is concerned for details. I just love his concern for this detail. He says, when you go into a place... And if a, house, if a house receives you, stay there until you leave that place. Now, why do you suppose he gave a direction like that? Because he knew people, and he knew his disciples. And he knows when they go into a town, somebody says to, one, to two of them, they went out two by two, that's so they would be encouraged. You know, if you have two people along together, then if one of you gets down, the other can pick you up. Or if one of you gets proud, the other can bring you low. You know, it's a wonderful balance, two walking together. That's so why the Christian life was never meant to be a life where we're called to live it alone. We're always meant to live it in association with other people. And, uh, but go and stay in that place. Why was that a good word? Because, you see, I, I can see it now. James and John were kind of social climbers. They were sons of thunder and upwardly mobile bound. And they would go into a village and somebody with a utility apartment who would say to them, now you can have the living, you can have the living room uh, because that's where the bed is, and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and sleep in the, in the uh, closet tonight. It's going to be a little crowded, but I'm sure glad you're here. And I don't have a whole lot to offer, but I, I'm so, so glad you brought me the good news about Jesus. And they say thank you. About two days later, someone has been healed, let's say, under their ministry, a dramatic healing, and it happens that the person who was healed is the daughter of the town's wealthiest man who has a 24-room Roman villa with jacuzzi, swimming pool, sauna bath, tennis courts, and a private golf putting range. James and John, would you like to come and stay at my house tonight? Uh, and after, I know it's been a long day preaching, and you'll love sitting in the sauna. And then just after that, having a little jacuzzi, it'll bless your soul. That's what we want, our souls to be blessed, you know. And... Uh, they come back to the one-room apartment uh, person and say, 
you know, I know it's such an inconvenience for me to stay here and I'm putting you out and all this. You know how we do, we put the blame on them, uh, putting you out. Hey man, I can't wait to get to the house with a jacuzzi. You know, let's make this person feel good as we gently let them down. <laughs> so off they go. How's that person going to feel like? What's going to be the integrity and credibility of the gospel if you do that to people? So Jesus said, first place you land, you stay there until you leave. That's it. Now they're going to think you're in it for the money or for the luxurious accommodations. It was interesting. I was in a place, some, I won't say where because I don't want to embarrass anybody that might hear this by accident. A place of ministry uh, in the, within the last year and I was put up in a place that uh, left a lot to be desired and I almost, it was, a, it was a hotel or motel or whatever it was. I'm not sure it was somewhere in those categories. <laughs> and uh, I almost said to myself, just forget it, George. Go spend your own money and stay uh, right down the street. There's a place that's just the same amount of money and, it, and I know it was so much nicer. I just, they don't know what's going on at this place. And, and Oh, this crazy Mark 6. If any place, you know, when you enter a town, stay there until you leave the place. I can't leave this place. The Lord's got me under orders. Oh, it was really interesting. And well, I had a good time. It was good discipline for me. But if they don't receive you, Jesus says, and this is the third limitation. He limited their geography, limited their baggage, and then he limited their language. So if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. Just take off your sandals and shake them. Get, I'm, I don't even want a piece of the dust of this town to stay on to me. Now, and what I'd submit to you is that that is a far different missionary methodology than we find in the book of Acts when the Apostle Paul was a missionary. There is a word in Acts used of the Apostle Paul as a missionary that occurs, crops up again and again, and that is the word disputed. He disputed with them, and it means in the Greek uh, logical argumentation. Paul didn't just go... Uh, testify and share people with his personal experience, although he did that, but he, he argued logically from the scripture or from history, the case for Jesus Christ and who he was. And he entered into dialogue with people, question and answer, dynamic kind of preaching. And if they rejected him, he just kept at it, you know. Why are they here shaking the dust off your feet when later in missionary work, they'll be presenting an apologetic, a logical presentation for the gospel? Well, I think it's a very simple reason. They didn't know enough to argue with anybody. <laughs> they really didn't. All they could do is say, I, they could say, Jesus is wonderful. He goes around healing people. He tells marvelous stories. You ought to believe on him. So he says, why should I believe on him? Jesus goes around telling stories, doing wonderful things. <laughs> He's done a wonderful thing in my life. Why should I believe in him? <laughs> you know, that's it for you, buddy. That's it. What Jesus is training them is, is to, don't wait until you know everything, until you can, you know, intellectually argue with somebody. Just share what's happened in your life. Person doesn't receive it, they're not ready for your testimony, move on. Don't, don't let it crush you. It's like if you were a freshman at UCI and you go to a philosophy of religions class. And the first day in philosophy of religion class, the professor who's, uh, let's say, educated at Berkeley or wherever, uh, makes a, just a devastating critique against Christianity. I'm not saying that all professors do this, but let's just say it happens. You're a freshman sitting there. Your heart's aglow with the love of Jesus Christ. He's made a difference in your life. You get a hold of the professor after class. And you say, but uh, Jesus has done a wonderful thing in my life. And he, if you get into an argument with him, if, you're, if you share your experience, you're okay. Nobody can argue with your experience. But if you start saying, now Immanuel Kant said, and Rene Descartes had this, and, but Francis Schaeffer said this, and C.S. Lewis said this, he's going to take you and make mincemeat out of you in about 30 minutes flat. You're going to wonder where in the world your faith is when you get done because he knows more than you, and if it's a matter of argument, he's going to kill you, Zunko. Let him get into an argument with Walter Martin, okay? Just send Walter over to the class. And then we're talking about peers. Now, you can testify Walter Martin can argue, all right? 
I mean, that's the difference. It's a training thing goes on. So Jesus says, don't, to the disciples, don't get all put off and don't get discouraged about witnessing if somebody doesn't receive your testimony. Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Somebody else is going to believe. Just keep going. And he knows his disciples are going to learn more as they follow him and they'll be able to handle things at more sophisticated levels as it comes that way. Does that make sense? I think that's what's happening. And the great thing is, wow, as they step out in faith, God does things. You know, you never grow in faith unless you get out on the edge. The disciples, had, as far as we know, never healed anybody until Jesus says, I'm not going to go with you this trip. I'm going to send you as an advance team out through Galilee. You're going to get everybody talking about me. Go out and heal the sick. In fact, Matthew's gospel says they got, well, I, now I'm adding. Okay, Matthew's gospel says they raised the dead. I think what they did is they got so excited when the sick were healed and demons were being cast out, they came to the dead person one day and said, hey, let's try our faith, you know, let's go for it. And that, that's what that's what happens as you step out to do the Lord's work. You grow in faith. But if you stand around all day waiting for something to do and say, well, someday I'll get around to it, faith never grows. Faith only grows when you get out on the cutting edge of risk and do something that the Lord's telling you to do but uh, looks like it humanly can't be done. Well, the next paragraph is a long paragraph. King Herod heard of it. That's... Uh, Herod of Galilee, not Herod the Great, we find, that killed the babies of Bethlehem. This is now a different Herod. King Herod heard it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, that that is why these powers are at work in him. Others said it's Elijah, and others said it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. It's a little interesting how people even then had a touch of reincarnation in their belief. When Herod heard of it, he said, hmm. John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Conscience bothering him. And then there's a flashback to a moment uh, probably a couple years earlier. For Herod had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Herod had two brothers who were named Philip. One was Philip of Iturea and another was Philip who went to Rome. It was this second Philip that had been Herodias's husband, she was about 40 years of age at the time, because he had married her. John said to Herod, oh, I'm tempted here to expand. John said to Herod, no, I shouldn't say this. It's okay for you to have your brother's wife and be on Christian TV. John said to Herod, it is not lawful for you. We don't like prophets. They're too blunt. It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. When he heard him, he was much perplexed, yet he heard him gladly. Oh, you talk about a confused personality. He wanted to come, but he couldn't lay aside his power. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, John was a gutty guy, wasn't he? I mean, he's telling the, telling the head political honcho, what you're doing is wrong. But on an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and the leading men of Galilee, stag party. That's what Mark is telling us. It was a stag party. For when Herodias' daughter came in, they'd seen dancers before, she pleased Herod and his guests. She really did a number. And the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will grant it. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of the kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, It's all been prearranged. It was her mother that had sent her in to do the dance because she knew what would please Herod anyway. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the baptizer. He didn't want half the kingdom. She wanted his head. She came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist. And then she adds a grisly detail. Since it's a banquet and food's being served, put it on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he's afraid of public opinion, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent a soldier of the garden, gave orders to bring his head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother, and when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. 
Isn't that a distressing story? That's one of those stories in life that keeps me away. And, and I know I've taken a few whacks at it in recent Sundays, but it's kind of where I am at this point. This kind of keeps me away from the positive confession boys. Because positive confession can't explain this. John the Baptist had an abiding and deep faith in God, a faith so deep that he had the guts to say right was right and wrong was wrong. It's the way it is. And for his efforts, off comes his head, served on a platter at a drunken stag party. And you want to say, if you're human, where is God in this process? And why doesn't God stop all this charade? God could have stopped it, but he didn't. Because there are those unexplainable things in life. And some things God has not, in his own sovereign will, determined to really reveal to us or to explain or to make up until we stand in that day whole in his presence. So, this paragraph is John beheaded. Dark moment. In that moment that it occurred a couple years before, or maybe just a year before, has now come back to haunt Herod because he hears about all these wonderful things that are taking place. The twelve have gone out and fanned out through Galilee and got everybody so excited that Herod's conscience is working overtime on him. It's John, he says. Notice how loyal John's disciples are. What a contrast between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. Think ahead for a moment to Jesus' own crucifixion. Did the disciples come and take his body and lay it in a tomb? No, they all split. So this is Mark's little way of giving a backhanded compliment to John's disciples and a put down to them. Here, John's disciples at least had the courage to come and get his body. Jesus' disciples fled and left it up to a wealthy man in Jerusalem to bury him and left it up to the women to come to the tomb. Nazareth rejection, village teaching, 12 cent, John beheaded. It's a dangerous time. So verse 30 we read, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. That's good advice. I mean, they'd been busy out there, and it was now getting psychologically and physically dangerous. Herod had killed John, who says he wouldn't come out and get them. So Jesus has started hanging around the lake more and more, gets in a little boat, and he gets out of there. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away to a boat in a lonely place by themselves, now many saw them going and knew them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And that's one of the great things when you're in Galilee. You can see all over the place. So when the boat's going, you just run around the shore. Went ashore, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place, and the hour is now late. You've messed up our day off, Lord. This was supposed to be vacation time. Remember, we're going on a retreat. This is a lonely place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the country and villages round about and buy themselves something to eat. He answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to them, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves of you? And they said, go and, uh, go, or go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Andrew had found the kid with the five and two. Then he commanded them all to sit down by companies upon the green grass. Note the detail, the grass was green. This has become important when we compare it to a later feeding shows uh, that it was spring of the year. Grass is not green in the summer and fall in Galilee. They sat down. It, that means that it was one year before Jesus' passion when this happens. One year before the passion. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. Jesus was an organizer. He just didn't let the group clump all over everywhere. They're going to have to be seated. We're going to have to deal with crowds and groups. He taught in an organized way and he organized people. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. That's to typical Jewish blessing. You always bless food or bless God before you eat food and after you eat food. He looked up to heaven, blessed it, broke the loaves, gave it to the disciples to set before them. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken fishes and of the fi of pieces and of the fish. And those 
who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Matthew says, not including women and children. This paragraph is 5,000 fed. It's one of the two feeding miracles in the Gospels. It's a nature miracle. And uh, Jesus, who had refused to turn stones into bread, now is turning bread and fish in a multiplying process. Which I wonder as he was doing it, if many in the crowd were even aware of what was happening, because the food was just naturally growing as it went along. And it was the disciples who became aware of the little bit they started out with. Now, William Barclay and some other New Orthodox people say that what we have here is not a real miracle. It is simply that when the little boy shared his five loaves and two fishes, everybody in the crowd pulled out the lunch that they had been hiding away from everybody else, got it out, and they all shared together. It was a wonderful uh, thing that turned everybody's generosity loose. The Gospels don't play it that way. In fact, in all, this is the only miracle of the 35 miracles Jesus did, only miracle that is found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we know from John's Gospel it was the turning point in his ministry because after this miracle he teaches about his body being bread that is broken and, and, his, uh, and they're then no, no longer do the crowds follow him to the extent that they had before. The feeding of the 5,000 and the disciples are at work as waiters Lord, we just have been healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, and you've got us waiting on people? You've got us serving bread and fish, Lord? It's not fair. People with REV in front of their name and DR in front of their name don't clean toilet bowls. They don't do things like pick up pieces of paper or polish windows. I mean, that's for people who don't have those titles. Jesus has got them out there Mater D's and waiters in the crowd. You know, it's a wonderful thing. I can see the kids. You, you know kids. And there were kids in that crowd. It always amazed me how Jesus teach, taught with all those kids present, running around. I can see kids there in the 12, you know, they're tired by this late in the day. You know, they're just exhausted and they're passing this stuff around and these little kids are sticking out their feet and tripping them as they go along. You know how little kids are. It's got to be an exasperating time. I think the miracle, I preached in the, in the graduation of the Bible school in Yugoslavia a few years ago. There was a handful of students. You look at Yugoslavia, 22 million people, four languages, two alphabets. Very few Christians in the country at that time, probably less than 5,000 Pentecostals in the country. And uh, you look at that handful of people. And the Lord gave me a message on that occasion. And, it, and I, I've since preached it. I think I've preached it in this church. But it comes out of the feeding of the 5,000. It's called How to Be a Failure. I give you a guaranteed formula that will ensure failure. If you follow these three steps, based on the feeding of 5,000, you'll fail at whatever you do. And I'll give you your money back if you don't fail. Is that a fair deal? Three steps. How to be a failure. One, look at the size of the task. 5,000 men plus women and children. 22 million people in Yugoslavia. 130,000 people in Costa Mesa, Newport. Whatever. Look at the size of the task. Go to school and get four years of education. Have enough money to do whatever. Look at the size of the task. Look at the little bit you have, five loaves and two fishes. Oh, Lord, I don't have much. If you put those two things together, the bigness of the task that God calls you to, the little bit you have, if you put those two together and add a third step, leave the Lord out of the picture. Leave the Lord out of the picture. You'll fail every time. There's no way you can ever get it put together. But the Lord is in the picture. And he multiplies the loaves and the fishes and they gather up the baskets. One for each of them so they'll have enough for the next day. Jesus was... A true environmentalist. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. He made them. They didn't want to get into a boat. They remembered what it's like out on that water at night. No wonder he had to make them get in the boat. Which goes to say, you know, Jesus has this marvelous way. If you don't learn the lesson the first time, I'm going to let you do it again. So in Mark 4, 35, they'd been out in the storm and they hadn't learned the lesson too well. Jesus had said, we're going to the other side and they got all fearful in the middle of the storm. So he rebuked them and he's saying, you know, they never really did learn that lesson. Have you ever had that happen in your life? You've been through something once and the Lord, with a sense almost of deja vu, lets you go through it again. No wonder he made them get into the boat. And go before, he's not even going to go with him this time. They're not going to wake him up in the boat. Go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd. And after he'd taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. He's going to be safe. When evening came, the wind was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. 
and about the fourth watch of the night, about between three and six in the morning. Now, he set them out at about sunset. They were easily getting across, got across Lake Galilee in an hour in the calm weather, but in the spring, let's see, Galilee gets dark around 8 o'clock at night, so you're at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're seven hours. They've been out rowing against the wind, not making much headway. Now, just put this scenario here. They've been out on this training mission in Galilee, two by two, sleeping in different beds every night. That'll, that'll make you tired just to begin with. Crowds around you all the time, teaching, preaching, you know, that'll make you tired. So they're tired. They get to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus says, them, Look, I know you're tired and it's dangerous with Herod and all that. Let's go aside by ourselves and rest. So they go for a rest and 5,000 plus women and children show up, about a crowd of 15,000 chase after them and they've got to serve as mater d's and waiters all day, carry all this stuff. And then when they're just exhausted and they want to bed down for the night, Jesus says, get in the boat. They get in the boat and they roll like crazy for seven hours and aren't going anywhere. Why is it that our worst trials always occur when we're dead tired? Have you found that to be so? There, the worst times I have practically in life is when I'm so exhausted I just can't face it. You know, and bang, there it is. It's a, it's a divine comedy. <laughs> you know, I think God thinks it must be funny or something, you know. <clears throat> Here it is. There's no shape to handle this, no shape whatever. And bang, there it is. So about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. <laughs> that is the strangest phrase in the gospel. <laughs> I just love it. He meant to pass by them. Uh, what does that mean? I'm sure anybody, that's probably what they thought. I, I, I think kind of he had in mind that he was going to get in the boat, but uh, they, 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 he looks like he's going by. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they, were all, for they all saw him and were terrified. Yeah, that rings, that rings authentic, doesn't it? I mean, that's exactly the reaction you would expect to be present if you were in the middle of the night and saw somebody walking across the water when you were fighting for your life. I think you would be terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, you know, a lot of people, by the way, take this as a New Testament mythology. This is, you know, a uh, fiction story. The psychological things are too real in it. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it's I, have no fear. He got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. Now, two things that perhaps could be said here, in addition to the fact that Jesus repeats lessons and, and that sometimes our worst trials occur when we're the tiredest and not ready to handle them. But another thing could be said, do you notice what's missing here? By the way, this paragraph is sea walk, okay, sea walk. You notice what's missing here? What's missing? What does Mark omit? Peter. Peter's getting out on the water and walking. Why does he omit it? Because Mark always does this. Whenever Peter looks good, it's not there. <laughs> it's, not, it's true. At Caesarea Philippi, for example, Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonas, upon this rock I will build my church. You won't find it in Mark. Wherever Peter looks bad, Mark just dwells on that, you know. <laughs> the denial, <laughs> the rooster crowing, you know, all that. Boy, I, Mark just goes into de reams and reams of detail on that. <laughs> What's going on? It's, as the early church fathers said, behind the gospel of Mark is the influence of Peter. Peter was meant the mentor of Mark. Mark wrote down a, a Papias, this early second century church father who was a disciple of John the Apostle and therefore only one step removed from the apostolic age. Papias says that Mark wrote down simply what Peter preached, and that therefore this gospel is a compilation of a sample of Peter's preaching. Well, I can buy that because Peter was a man of action, and this gospel is a gospel of action. You notice how many times the word immediately has occurred? Immediately, immediately. Forty-one times it occurs in 16 chapters. Immediately. Next thing, action. Always something going on. That's Peter. And so Peter, when he preaches, doesn't make himself look good. He talks about his weaknesses rather than his strengths. I think that's commendable, good measure of humility for somebody that asked for the chief place in the kingdom at one time and argued about who was greatest. <laughs> you know, some lessons do get through. Thank God they get through. If we live long enough, we'll get changed enough. All right? That's encouraging. And then there's this other thing that comes out of this story. For they did not understand about the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. What a mystical text there. What has that got to do with the water? Someone has said, well, it's got everything to do with it because in the middle of the storm, they forgot they were sitting on the basket full of their last miracle. 
they had taken 12 baskets full of leftover fish and bread and taken it in a boat with them for the next day's lunch. In the middle of the storm, they forgot all about the loaves and fishes and how God, you know, really meets us and how the Lord provides for us and all that kind of thing. And they forgot. You see, they have the problem we do. I do anyway. I won't say you. I'll just say me. The Lord works in one area of our life. Wonderful. Three weeks later, we're facing a situation, maybe parallel, it may be totally different. But what happens? Panic sets in. And we forget what the Lord has done in the past. Because we're just so sure that this time we're facing a situation that we won't emerge out of. And so he reminds them of the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. They failed to take in the fact that he was the one who worked in unusual ways to preserve and protect and feed his people. And they weren't going to go down in that lake. Do you know that not one of the 12 died at the bottom of the Lake of Galilee? And we're probably not going to die of the things we fear either. We're going to die of something else. Like getting crucified upside down or something exciting like that. Last paragraph. Can you remember the paragraphs now? We've got uh, Nazareth rejection, village teaching, 12 cent, John beheaded, 5,000 fed, sea storm, and this last paragraph, Gennesaret healings. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. Now, immediately there's a geographical problem that emerges, and you might not initially pick this up, but if you're looking at a map of the Holy Land and see what's around the Lake Galilee, you know that the implications are that the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 took place probably on the northwestern side of Lake Galilee to the west of Capernaum. And when they get into the sea to go to the other side to Bethsaida, there was a Bethsaida that was to the northeast uh, point of the Lake of Galilee, and it was in not Herod's territory, but in Philip, his brother's territory. But when they actually come to land, they're at Gennesaret, which is on the southwest side of the lake. So if they started out going northeast, they wound up at the southwest point, which seems confusing. Does that make sense? Did I put that out clearly enough? You following me? There's either a second Bethsaida uh, that is in that part, or they started out for Bethsaida, but the wind finally blew them down to Gennesaret. It's the only thing I know. Gennesaret's a beautiful plain. One of the things in Gennesaret you'll see today, if you go to Gennesaret, is that there is a kibbutz there, and they, last year, when Lake Galilee was, was at its lowest level probably in human history, Lake Galilee today is used uh, for a, a tremendous amount of the freshwater needs of the country of Israel. They drained the lake so much that it was down at such a low level that uh, someone unearthed a boat from the first century, a fishing boat from the first century. And so they used all kinds of protective measures to get this boat out of the mud. They couldn't let it dry out because if the wood dried out, it would just uh, go puff. I mean, it would, it would just disintegrate. So they kept it submerged, and you can go through and see this first century boat, and boy, it takes you right into the Gospels. I mean, you know exactly what kind of a boat Jesus fell asleep in. It's a fishing boat from the first century. It's been preserved in Galilee for 20 years. Not the boat. It didn't go down in the storm. We read in the Gospels, okay. But it was a boat from that period. Gennesaret, beautiful area. They grow bananas there today. It's always been a fertile area. When they crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about the whole neighborhood and began to bring sick people on their pallets to any place where they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and besought him that they may touch even the fringe of his garment and as many as touched it were made well. One of the things that Mark does for us as we follow along is to show us that in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his miracles happened out of his sovereignty. They happened spontaneously. They did not at times even, even seem to be attached to faith on the part of the recipient. But as his ministry grows, his miracles become increasingly dependent and he allows them to become dependent upon people's faith which is a way of our saying, and I have to say this to myself because I've been one in the body of Christ today who's pled for balance. We ought to believe both in healing and we ought to believe in perseverance. We always don't know where those two meet. But there will never be healings, physical or emotional or spiritual, unless faith is really present. In order for faith to be present, we need to be in an environment 
where we see and are encouraged by what the Lord is doing and how he's at work. Why are they touching the fringe of his garment? Well, a little lady broke through to him in a crowd and touched the fringe of his garment. And the story got around. That's what works. So that became the point of contact. That's the secret of healing. Use the method. It's not the method, friends. It's the faith that goes with it. And Jesus allowed the point of contact because he saw the genuine faith of people. And Jesus knows as he comes striding into our life that without faith, we cannot function either. We must have faith in our life, and as we have faith, and do not become resigned to things the way they are, whatever circumstance we're facing, do not become resigned to them, but continue to press through to the Lord. There will be a resolution. If the resolution is not in our outer circumstances, it will be in us. But keep pressing. So we have these seven paragraphs. The common theme that unites them, one word can describe what unites them, and that is the word disciples. Jesus, all through this section, is with his disciples. He's carving out major time now to be with the twelve. I, you know, I once did a, a color analysis of Jesus' life in which I took all the paragraphs in Mark and colored them, 116 paragraphs, and I, I color-coded. If, um, if Jesus was alone, I gave that paragraph one color. If Jesus was with crowds, I gave that another color. If Jesus was with the opposition, I gave that another color. And if Jesus was with, was with his disciples, I gave that another color. My hypothesis when I began to do this, when I was first studying the Gospel of Mark, was that as Jesus' ministry built, you would see him more and more turning to the crowds. Because there's, that's the nature of every campaign, isn't it? You want to reach the masses. So the longer Jesus' ministry would go, the more color would be that he was with the crowds. I was amazed when I got on Analyzing Mark to note that the longer Jesus' ministry went, the more time he was spending with the few, the more time he was spending with the twelve, because Jesus sought that intimacy and that personal training with them. And it reminds me in my life, and it reminds us all in our life, that when we come to Jesus, we are not some face lost in a crowd, that Jesus is not got somehow a record in heaven that says, well, George Wood was part of 300 people or whatever. But uh, he individualizes, and he wants to take time to focus on our lives. And one of the beautiful things we can do as we study the Bible and as we share together in prayer is that we can spend time with one another, and I want us to do that as we close our time of worship this evening, to focus on two by two or four by four, spending some moments praying for one another, encouraging one another, and letting the Lord speak to us through moments of being gathered in his name. So I'd like for you to stand. Would you do that?